very much. Thank you all for coming. It's a, a pleasure to be here and talk to you a little bit about um, potential changes in mountain environments um, that might occur over the next 50 to 100 years. I grew up around mountains. I'm from Switzerland. Um, I work in mountain environments um, from a young age, mostly in South America. In the winter, I go skiing in the mountains in, in uh, the Northeast. So I want to show you a little bit from my very own personal perspective um, what I think we might be able to anticipate going forward. Um, just to quickly um, make this clear, what I'm going to show you is not really a scientific talk. Mountain environments lend themselves really well to actually visualize what is occurring. Um, so I'm going to show you a lot of pictures um, and projections, visual um, ways of understanding how our, our environment might change. And the work that we've been doing is a, is a large group. Some of the names are up there, but there's actually many more. This is a group from a paper that, a review paper on mountain environments that, that we just published. And a lot of the work that we've been doing over the past few years um, was funded by the US State Department in a, in a five-year project on climate change adaptation in the mountains of South America. A big focus of that project was capacity building and adaptation, so we also had funding from UNESCO and the Inter-American Development Bank, so I wanted to acknowledge them here quickly as well. So, when we think about mountains, most of us don't live actually in mountains, most of the world's population actually lives along coastlines or we live in, in lowlands, but in one way or another almost all of us are affected by what is occurring in mountains. For example, coastal communities through sea level rise will be directly affected what happens in mountains because that's where currently a lot of the water is stored as ice. And maybe the biggest impact is water. We tend to think of mountains as the water towers of the world because not everywhere but in most mountains you have more precipitation than in the surrounding lowlands because of what we call orographic precipitation when air masses reach the mountains they are forced to lift up. When they lift up, they cool, rain out, so we get more precipitation in those environments. A lot of that precipitation, because it's cold, is stored as snow seasonally or as ice on even longer time scales. And that really is a water resource that we have in the mountains that is gradually released over time and replenished through snowfall, and that allows us to maintain water in, in rivers and lakes um, throughout the years. With that, and basically allows us to get by dry periods or droughts. But I wrote down another, a number of other impacts that we can observe, um, or a number of other sectors, if you will, that might be affected by climate change, and I will go through some of those. Again, my own work is very biased. I work in the Andes, so most of what I'm going to show you is from the Andes, but I'll try to also give you a few examples from um, the Alps, North America, and, and Africa as well. So basically the idea is, we are transforming our environment because of climate change. The most obvious and the visual impact of that will be a change in the frozen, what we call the cryosphere, snow and ice. So we will transform our environment. The glaciers will become smaller. In some places, they may completely disappear. Um, snow cover will become less and less. And the question is, what, what are associated impacts and how can we deal with those? So I figured the first thing I would do is I'll take you on a quick trip through the Andes, um, my second office, if you will, and just show you through what we call repeat photography what the changes are. Repeat photography basically means you go to the same place over time and just take a picture from the same place, same angle, and you observe the changes. And with glaciers, this is really nice because glaciers do not change their extent from winter to summer or dry season to wet season. It's not like snow cover. They stay the same. They only respond on longer time scales, so if they shrink or expand, it means that the climate's actually changing. So the first example is from Venezuela. This is the highest peak in Venezuela, Glacier Espejo, the Pico Bolivar. This was about 100 years ago. And you can see how the environment here is changing. This ice has completely disappeared. On the back side of this mountain, there's a tiny ice patch left, less than one square kilometers. We expect in 10 or 15 years, there will be no ice left in Venezuela. Colombia, very similar situa situation. We have six mountain ranges in Colombia that still have ice. This here is the Sierra Nevada del Cocuy, 
but all of these mountains are in a bad situation because when, when the temperatures warm and the glaciers shrink, basically what happens is they retreat to higher elevations where it's colder and they try to find a new equilibrium with the, with the changing climate. But if the mountains aren't high enough, they kind of run out of space and they will eventually uh, disappear. And in all six mountain ranges in Colombia, none of them are very high for tropical standards. And we expect that Colombia also will lose its last glaciers um, before the middle of this century. Another example, this is from Peru, um, an ice cap called Calcaia. This is from the 1970s, a photo from my colleague Lonnie Thompson, who works at Ohio State. And here, about 30 years later, you can see the retreat of the glacier. You can also see that the meltwater sometimes that forms when the glacier melts can't run off and it forms lakes. I'll come back to that in a little bit because that can be a significant uh, natural hazards for populations who live downstream, especially if the sediments here that dam the lake are not well consolidated and can easily be breached. Another example from the Canopta in Peru. And just to summarize this, so you don't think I cherry-picked the examples that fit my preconceived notion, this is a summary slide from a review paper we wrote a few years ago, looking at all the data we have from all the monitored glaciers. It shows you the area loss in percent. The only really important line here is the thick black one. That's the average over the entire tropical Andes. And it shows you by how much or how much surface area we're losing in percent every year. And you can see the values are negative. We're now losing about 3% per year. And this uh, is trending down, which means that the loss is accelerating over time. By the way, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me and, and just ask. Sometimes it's easier to discuss when the figure is out there. Just to quickly show you from some other parts of the world that this is not something that's limited to the Andes. This is my home country, Switzerland. This is a photograph from around 1900. We had black and white photography only back then. So what they used to do, they used to paint the postcards. So they are nice and colorful. So this is a black and white photograph and then painted over from Morterach Glacier. This is the same glacier 100 years later. Again, if I go back and forth here, you can see, for example, along the edges of the glacier, the moraines that are still in the same place. But in the valley, you can see there's now a, a path. It's a, it's a glacier path where you can learn about glaciers and climate change. And you can actually see by how many kilometers the glacier has retreated um, over time. Just to show you that this is not something that has only occurred in the past, it's actually a very, very rapid process probably nowhere as fast as in the Alps. This is a, a picture from just six years ago, and this was four years later. Um, again, you can see how rapid the retreat is. And in the Alps, same thing. We expect that by the end of this century, 95% uh, of the ice will be lost. So we'll have basically ice-free mountains in the Alps. Um, and finally, one more example. Again, this is just seven years apart. It's another example where one of these lakes formed. You can see how fast this process is occurring. Um, we can not only look back, we can now also try to project forward what will happen going forward. And we can do that by combining glacier models. And glacier models are basically models that simulate how much snow falls, how much melts. So they simulate the energy and the mass balance. And then um, they combine that with the so-called dynamic flow model because glaciers basically are flowing like honey. As a result of gravity, they from, from higher elevations down the valley. If we combine all that and then we, we force it with climate change scenarios, we can simulate what will happen going forward. This is also from Switzerland. This is the Alec Gletscher. This region is a United Nations World Heritage Site. Um, up here, is what's called the top of Europe. This is the highest place in Europe you can go with a train. Um, it's a really nice touristic site up there. It's also an observatory um, for ozone and meteorological research. But you can go up here and basically look down over this entire landscape. And here is one estimate of how it will transform this century. 
exactly how fast this process will be, we don't know. That depends a little bit on the scenario that we're choosing, and there are a lot of uncertainties, of course, as to how we will continue to emit greenhouse gases in what, in what quantities, but this is a middle of the road um, scenario. So basically, we're going from this landscape here by the end of the century to something like this. If you look at the topography under the ice, you will see it's not flat, so the, ice, the melting ice is going to lead to a lot of lakes in this region. We're basically replacing a, a glacial landscape with a lake um, landscape. This might be very nice too to visit, but it will be very different from today. And one other example, this is from Kilimanjaro. Um, this is from, taken from an airplane. Well, the Nickel Holzer who flew around Kilimanjaro in 1930 took this. Again, you can see the um, ice and also the snow. Obviously, Kilimanjaro famous through Ernest Hemingway's novel, The Snows of Kilimanjaro, but it's actually not just snow, there's also ice up there. This is the highest peak in Africa, <coughs> located in Tanzania. And here's what it looked like in 2005. You can see there's, these slope glaciers are still there, but they're much, much smaller. Um, in the year 2000, we went up on Kilimanjaro to install a weather station on the ice. And if you go inside, um, Kilimanjaro is a volcano, if you go inside, um, you see these vertical cliffs of ice. They're, those are about 50 meters tall. So this photo is actually taken from inside of the crater. So what you're seeing here is looking outside. This is the crater wall. And you can also see some tents there in the foreground. This is um, where we camped. And the reason for this is that the only way, it's a really, really dry place. And the only place you can get water um, is the water from the ice. And it's dripping really fast down these cliffs. You can put a bottle here at the edge of the cliff and 10 minutes later you have a nice bottle of fresh, crystal clear cold water. But then a few years later, um, I saw in accounts from other people who were up there in the National um, Geographic magazine who witnessed the collapse of one of these ice cliffs. And the reason it collapsed is it was just completely saturated with meltwater. You can actually see the water here that is gushing out. And again, these are 50 meters vertical cliffs. So we realized it's probably not so smart to camp right at the edge <laughs> of those cliffs, but we didn't know. And here is just a compilation of the evidence we have from Kilimanjaro. So everything that's blue is glacier ice over the course of the 20th century. The early pictures are from uh, maps, and then the rest is um, aerial photography and satellite images. And uh, same thing, um, the ice on Kilimanjaro will not survive, that's for sure. We'll still have snow falling, but there will be no more ice in a few decades. Um, so just to summarize, what is the evidence and what is the reasons for all this? If you just have a glacier retreat in one place, you can say maybe it's because it's getting drier, it's not snowing as much. But we have this evidence throughout the mountain regions all over the world, and the only variable that is consistently changing on our planet is temperature. It's getting warmer, that leads to more melt, and that's why these glaciers are retreating. And in fact, um, energy companies confirmed this already in the 1960s. This is from um, an advertisement in a, in a magazine from the 1960s, and you can read the headline below. They're bragging of how much el uh, ice they can melt by burning um, fossil fuels. I don't think they would put that ad in the newspaper anymore today. So, the role of, of um, snow and ice in water supply. I want to give you an example just to sort of show what this environmental service really entails. So we're picking out an example here in Peru. This is the Cordillera Blanca, which is shown here. This is the world's most densely glaciated mountain range in the tropics. And I picked out two catchments here, shown with the red and the blue dot. They're the same mountain range, exact same climate. Plotted over here is for the red and the blue catchment, two lines. It's the seasonal cycle of precipitation. That's the dashed line where it says CP and then the seasonal cycle of runoff, which is the solid line um, below. And you can see that the dashed line looks the same in both catchments. We have a wet season here from maybe December through March, followed by a dry season in June, July, and August. It's the exact same down here because we're in the same mountain range. 
but the solid line looks very different. In this blue catchment here, you can see when it rains a lot, we also have a lot of water in the rivers, solid line. When it's dry, we have very little water in the rivers. Over here in this red catchment, however, the runoff is much more smooth and balanced. We have less water during the wet season, but we have a consistently high base flow even during the dry season. The only difference between these two catchments is what's written here, the percent of glaciation. The red catchment, a third of the catchment is covered by a glacier. It acts like a dam. When it's snowing, that snow is not melting. It gets incorporated into the ice and stored and gradually released over time. And that guarantees the high base flow during the wet season. If you don't have a glacier that can provide this environmental service, if it's not raining, your rivers are dry. And we are now basically transforming all our environments from this type of red catchment to a blue catchment. So we're losing this environmental service. Here is one city that depends to 100% on this glacial meltwater, the city of Huaraz in this Cordillera Blanca, which you see in the background. All socioeconomic activities from drinking water, sanitation, um, electricity production through hydropower, agriculture, irrigation, mining, everything is powered by water from these, from these glaciers. So here's just one other example of, of irrigation um, that is also driven by this type of water. A lot of the water is diverted down to the coast. Along the Peruvian coast, we have large irrigation projects for export-oriented crops, avocados, asparagus, um, clementines, um, grapes. And this water is transported down first by the river, then in pipelines, and then in these channels. The coast is a complete desert. There's no rain there, um, as you can see. But um, there are now very, very large and rapidly expanding irrigation projects for export-oriented products, all depending on the same glacial melt. We have problems with snow and ice in the United States too. Um, out west, here it's less, less of a glacier issue, it's more of a snow cover issue. So this map here, these red and blue dots, they show you by how much our snow cover has changed over the last 60 years out west. The way we measure snow cover is the snow water equivalent. We basically look at how much water is stored in the snow. And we do this at the beginning of April because that's when usually the snowpack reaches its maximum. And everything that's red, you can see the legend on the right, shows you by how much the snowpack has decreased. There's a few places where it has gone up, but overall we've seen a rapid decrease in this snowpack. And again, this is water that is stored, that is released gradually over time, and that may not be available during the dry summer months if it melts too early or if not enough of it is available. Again, of course, we can build dams, we can try to store the water and then release it when we need it. Um, that is obviously done in the Western United States. But if you have the snow melt occurring too early or if there's not enough snow and too much of it comes as rain, it will fill up your reservoir too early in the spring and you won't be able to store all that water. You have to release some of it and it goes unused and then you do not have enough in the summer. And if you then compare that or combine that with droughts, such as occurred between 2011 and 2014 out west, you end up with almost empty reservoirs, as you can see. Um, so water is a big issue. Natural hazards are a big issue. I mentioned this lake, and we see these lakes forming almost everywhere now, and they are increasingly um, being monitored. Um, there have been major disasters, again, in particularly in Peru, but also in the Himalayas in the past. Here's one example. This happened after an earthquake. A big chunk of um, ice fell off this mountain, was around. It led to a huge mud flow, killing more than 6,000 people. There are now warning systems in place um, in, in, in many locales. We'll come back to that in a minute as well. Another thing we're seeing is that we are losing and the stability of mountain slopes for a number of reasons. One reason is, is when you go high enough up, the, um, the soil on the ground is actually kept together by ice. We call this permafrost. The soil is actually frozen. It's like glued together with the ice. With the warming temperature, this permafrost start, starts to thaw and it creates unstable conditions. Also, when you have a glacier in a valley, it pushes the sediments to the side and keeps them stable in place. When you lose that restraint, 
um, slopes can become unstable and you end up with situations like this. Then we have the ecological impacts downstream from snow and ice. We have ecosystems that have adapted for a very long period of time, thousands of years, to the specific conditions of the water that comes down. Water that is released from snow, and particularly from ice, has a different chemistry, temperature, turbidi turbidity. So there is um, invertebrate fauna that, that has adapted to that over long periods of time. They're at the bottom of the food chain. They feed um, reptiles, amphibians, avifauna, birds, in, in many environments that will likely be transformed um, once that glacial meltwater is no longer available. And of course, the meltwater also serves for um, pastoral communities, that the, the glacial meltwater in many places leads to the creation of wetlands, like this one that you see here. In the Andes, these wetlands are used for grazing, llamas, alpacas, the local population um, lives off those animals as their main income. They sell the wool and, and the meat. Um, so again, there are direct consequences for those local inhabitants who live closest to the glaciers. And then there's tourism. And I'll show you a few examples of that. The first one is a bit more anecdotal, but it's nonetheless interesting. This is from a mountain called Chacaltaya in Bolivia. This used to be the world's highest ski resort. The peak here is at about 5,400 meters, an hour's drive from the city of La Paz. People would go up here, they would have home ski races. La Paz had an alpine skiing club. Um, in the 1990s, you could still ski there when I first visited, and it's now completely disappeared. This is not a huge economic impact. This was a minor um, tourism aspect. Um, but this, in the coming decades, will become increasingly a problem in, in bigger resorts, uh, for example, out in the west in the Rocky Mountains. Here's an example from Aspen, Colorado. You can sort of see the elevational difference between the base and the peak elevation. And then you see the shaded area in the middle of the mountain. Anywhere in that shaded range is where the projections are um, for the uh, end of the century where the snow line will be, basically the transition from snow to rain. So it's unlikely that you will be able to ski all the way down unless it's cold enough to make snow. But if, even if that's the case, then you will end up with a situation like this, like last year in Switzerland. You can make snow and you can ski, but I'm not sure how attractive this will be to um, bring skiers in, into the region. And for Switzerland in particular, that's a major problem because their skiing is a big part of the economy in the winter for tourism. We have a similar situation in the United States in the Northeast. We have obviously ski resorts here. I'm not sure how many of you are skiers or snowboarders, but maybe you recognize some of these dots. These are the major ski resorts we have in the Northeast. And then the other three panels, they show you for the near future, the middle of the century and the end of the century. Um, basically those ski resorts that might be able to still be viable by the end of this century. And I wrote down the three criteria that were used in this study, what economic viability means. So you have to be open for 100 days to have enough revenue, three out of four winters during Christmas, between Christmas and New Year, when the resorts make most of their money, and cold enough at night so you can make snow. And you can see again, the higher elevations are probably those that are in a better position, the Green Mountains, the White Mountains in Vermont and New Hampshire, but uh, skiing in the lower part of New England will probably become the exception. One way we can think about this in a very, very simple way is we can plot up how long we have snow on the ground based on what the amount of snowfall is that falls during the winter, that's your y-axis in millimeters of snow per day, and how cold it is in the winter, that's the x-axis. So these purple and yellow and light blue colors they show you how many days we have snow on the ground. So for example, if you're up here, that means it's very um, cold, obviously in the winter, minus seven, minus eight degrees Celsius, and very wet, so you have a lot of snow, so you have about 350 days of snow on the ground, this purple color. On the other hand, if you're here, it means it's very warm and very dry, uh, so you do not have a, a, a snow cover for a long time. So we can pick out a couple of ski resorts in Switzerland, this one, Santis, is in a location that's high up 
exposed to the westerly winds. It gets a lot of snow when it's cold. So it has snow almost 325 days a year. By the end of the century, depending on scenario, this resort will obviously warm up. So it moves from here over into this region, but it'll still have enough snow to ski almost 200 year, days a year with snow. But here's another example, Arosa. Arosa is lower down, it's in an interalpine valley, a very dry climate and warmer. And you can see by the end of the century, it will be over here, less than 25 days of snow um, per winter, and that will not be enough for this specific resort to maintain a viable skiing tourism. Um, so they will have to diversify and figure something else out to attract tourists in the winter months. In the US, of course, we also have tourism that is related to mountains. Uh, maybe the most famous one is Glacier National Park. I'm not sure have any of you visited. Okay, quite a few. So you may even know this site, but we probably didn't look like this when you were there. Um, this is Boulder Ice Cave. You can see a few people here for scale. The reason they're standing here is because you used to be able to go into this cave and look at the glacier from below. Um, this is from the same location. If you look at the horizon, you will see it's the same picture. It has completely disappeared. Glacier National Park is the exact same situation as I said in the beginning, um, Colombia. Um, the mountains there are not very high. And the glaciers are already very small now. They have almost no accumulation zone left. Those glaciers are not going to survive. 20, 30 years from now, there will be no ice left in Glacier National Park. We can say that with a high degree of certainty. So we'll have to be renamed Glacier Less National Park. <laughs> um, tourism in the Andes is also important for a, a, a local economy that it maintains for everybody, for people who go climbing, alpinism, People who want to scale peaks. Um, I did a lot of that in my younger years, mostly for work though. We would go up on these mountains and set up um, weather stations and um, we had tremendous help from porters and guides who through this, this work could earn a living. It's amazing the amount of, of the loads that they can carry. But basically when you get to the base of the mountain, the entire community wants to help children, women, men, everybody want to just earn a, a, a few dollars, they just grab what they can and start running up the mountain. Um, and obviously guides as well. We would go up on some of these peaks that were 6,500 meters or higher to work, so we would have to go slowly with guides. Um, not easy work and we felt it was quite something that we accomplished going up there. Um, it's just one other one of our guides. But then you see the Bolivian women going up there, no alpine gear whatsoever, in their sandals, just running up the glacier and we completely unable to follow, so it put our effort a little bit in perspective. <laughs> but that is also part of a local economy, um, because many of these mountains are climbed thousands of times a year, mostly by North American and European uh, climbers who go and, and climb in these mountains. And finally, the last point I wanted to bring up has to do more with culture, religion and belief systems. And again, I can only speak to this from the Indian perspective, but I'm sure similar issues are also occur in other parts of the world. But in the Andes, the mountains have a very high value for the indigenous population. They grew up in that environment, they depend on it, they live with it, they, they see it as a source of life, but at the same time also as a threat. And for them, the mountains are home to gods and also home to living beings. And they see, they worship the mountains and they see how these environments are rapidly changing. There's this one example from a mountain range in Peru. There used to be a mountain called um, Sleeping Lion because the mountain had the sh shape of a sleeping lion, so they called it Leon Dormido. The glacier on top of that mountain melted, so the mountain sh changed shape. It didn't look like the the lion was there anymore, so they had to rename it to Lion Has Left. So in Spanish, this went from Leon Dormido to Leon Se ha ido. It's just one example of how they, they um, associate life uh, with these mountains. But they, in many places, have pilgrimages. It's an example from Peru, where they would go to the base of the mountains. They used to actually go up on the mountains with candles to worship the gods. They don't do this anymore because they are seeing how rapidly the ice is retreating. They associate that not necessarily with global climate change, 
but more with local disruption. Scientists trampling around on the ice, people going up, um, so they now have guards in place and make sure that nobody goes up. Um, they also used to bring blocks of ice back if they had somebody who was sick at home because they associate healing power with this ice. Um, all of these practices have stopped. In the past, they also often used the ice um, and would, would bring it to the cities. Um, before everybody had a refrigerator, they would actually use these ice blocks to, to cool the food. And one final example associated with these culture beliefs, I said that to the threat of these lakes that are forming and that can drain quickly and create butt flows, in order to deal with that, we can set up early warning systems. Here's one of those systems that was set up in 2015 by my Swiss colleagues. It has geophones, so it measures any slight tectonic activity. It has cameras that are faced towards both the mountain slope and the lake. So if there's any movement in the ice or any change of the lake level, um, these, these images are, are transmitted in real time to a receiving station that is constantly monitored. They have activation plans in place. Basically, the idea is that if something happens up there, that there's enough time to evacuate the town down there. But this monitoring system was set up during 2015 at the beginning of a very strong El Nino event. This led to a large drought in the region. The rains did not come, the monsoon rains. And the um, farmers became more and more worried and angry, and they blamed this station for it. They said, the scientists went up there without our permission. They angered the gods, this station needs to come down. The mayor first refused, but in the end, the pressure became so large, he had to give in. They went up, they dismantled the whole thing. As soon as it was dismantled, it started to rain. Ironically enough. So it just goes to show that adaptation, this was part of an adaptation project adapting to, to natural hazards and threats. But if you do not involve the local population, it's, it's um, very, very difficult to do. So in the last five minutes or so, I, I just quickly want to talk a little bit about adaptation and some lessons that we've learned. Here's an example of probably how we should not adapt. This is an example from Peru where a couple of engineers had the brilliant idea that in order to bring the glacier back, we could paint the mountain where the glacier used to be white. If you paint the surface white, you change the reflectivity, albedo as we call it, you reflect more sunlight back to space rather than the sunlight heating up the surface, and it would cool the mountain. And this isn't going to work, but just so you get a sense of this, the World Bank, before they started this, issued a contest and said whoever comes up with the best adaptation project that can be implemented in short time, we will award $200,000. This is the project that won. And then we went to some colleagues and, and I, we went to the World Bank and we went to the Peruvian Ministry of Environment and we, we told them and we in a short PowerPoint explained why this won't work and then they, they rescinded the award. Um, so this is silly, it won't work, but at the same time it also shows how desperate people are and to what measures they might go to actually try to, to protect their glaciers. Another example from Switzerland, there they also have an a, a ice cave just like the one I showed you from Glacier National Park. It's also threatened, you can see the glacier at the lower part there is very, very dirty, it's grey, which means it absorbs a lot of the solar energy. They, what they did is they put a huge white tarp over the glacier, thinking it might cool the glacier and reflect sunlight back, just to maintain that cave because it's a tourist attraction. Again, it's a band-aid, it might work for a few years, but personally, I want to see a nice natural glacier, not something like this. Um, and again, it, it will not work in the long run. So what can we do? From an engineering perspective, we have a few options. We can create water reservoirs. If the glaciers aren't there, we can build dams. The problem with that is, well, there's environmental problems, but one problem we noted in, in, in one case, again, in Peru, once you build a dam, you can regulate when you want to release the water. Who determines when you release how much water? Because in the Andes, a lot of the water is used for hydropower. Those companies, they want the water during peak electricity demand, and they want to release a lot of water very, very quickly to produce electricity. Farmers do not like that. that they can't use them. Um, they use the water at different times 
and in much smaller quantities. It created huge problems. In the end, one dam was occupied by farmers. They actually occupied it for years. The dam was um, built and, and belonged to the hydropower company, but they were forced out with weapons because they, the farmers basically said, we have no water left the way you manage it. So creating adaptation sometimes makes it more complicated. We can look for groundwater or other new water resources. We can try to use less water. Some of those coast irrigation projects that I showed you, they have now implemented new drip water technology that was imported from Israel. They have tiny pipelines that go to the roots of every individual plant and you just release drop by drop by drop so you don't waste any water. Um, in some parts of the Andes, there's enough water, but it's very dirty, so maybe if we could recycle it and reuse it through water treatment, that might help as well. Then there's a number of policy instruments. I don't want to go into details um, of these right now, but I just want to show you a little bit what we did in our project in the last five minutes. One thing that I think is really important and that we focused on is that there's not enough communication between the different um, actors that are involved in this, and that includes the local population that is affected, it includes water managers, it includes um, policy and decision makers such as mayors, for example, and it also includes scientists. And um, one thing we've really focused on is to try to expand outreach, um, be it by having um, meetings where we actually listen to what the needs are of the local population, but also through um, ways of, of publicizing scientific information in a way that is easy to understand, um, be it through public displays and plazas and so forth. We wrote a series of reports that are um, not in a technical scientific language, but easy to understand for policymakers. Policy briefs with little text and lots of figures. Um, we wrote a report, a recommendation for um, the Inter-American Development Bank on how they could move forward with adaptation project. And um, a lot of these manuals are written in English and in Spanish, so they also get disseminated in the Indian countries. And then we spent a lot of time um, working on capacity building, workshops in the field. This is one example from a workshop on glaciology um, that we held in Chile. Here's another one where actually Oscar was sitting here, my graduate student, um, was part of as well. This is from a, a workshop where we train students in climate change analysis, climate modeling. Um, these are um, South American students so that we can build capacity in these countries so that they can deal with some of these problems um, themselves and do not de um, depend on, on, on outside um, information. And finally, really, really important as far as adaptation in the Andes go, there's a lot of money that is pouring into these countries from different entities, World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, Swiss Development Corporation, the French, the Germans, USAID, CARE, and so forth. But all these entities aren't really talking to one another. They all have their pet projects, do their own thing. And there's a lot of redundancy that is occurring here. And in, quite frankly, waste um, of money as well. So what we try to do is to bring all these players to the table so they talk to one another, that we can um, better cooperate and coordinate projects um, in the region. So I want to end with that. Um, but I hope I've given you sort of a, a glimpse into the work that we're doing um, in the Andes. And if you have any questions, then I'm, I'm more than happy to answer them. Yeah. It just seems to me that there's going to be a direct action to the food supply because your population is getting more and more. And if you're talking about less regulation of water for farmers, we've got a perfect storm going on there. Well, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I fully understand. Well, you're going to need to have more food because right. there's more people. Yes. And you're having less regulation of the water. You're running into less and less water from the glaciers and mountains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Again, that is not equally relevant everywhere, but the glaciers are particularly important in regions that are seasonally dry, where you have a long dry season, and in particularly in, in closer proximity 
to the glaciers. Um, and there it's certainly a problem. Um, it, is, it is a supply problem, but as you mentioned, it's also a demand problem. Um, the demand for water is going up very, very quickly. Yeah, I agree. It's bleak. Yeah. Is that possible to bring this glacier back? I mean, now we saw those mountains, I mean, the ice just melt and disappear. But is that possible that they come back? <laughs> yeah. Um, we are a very young generation. We, I, well, I think in 30 years, as you said, many glacier mountains will disappear. But I will be still alive. So, so, normally, so, okay. okay. So I don't want to see this sad. Yeah, so, so, again, you know, glacier disappearing, um, it, it really, this is, this is not, it's, it's in the end a regional um, question. It really depends where you are and how high your mountains are. If you go to the Himalayas, you will still have glaciers in 100 years because they're more than 8,000 meters high. They will be smaller, but they will still be there. Um, if you go all the way to the south in South America to Patagonia, you will still have ice. We have two um, big ice sheets there, the Patagon northern and southern Patagonian ice sheets. They will still be there in smaller extent. You will still have ice in Antarctica. You will still have ice in Greenland. Um, but in the tropical Andes, there will be very little ice left in Europe also. Um, and also out west, there will be not, be not be a whole lot of ice left. So it depends where you go. As far as bringing glaciers back, <laughs> um, that is very difficult to do. What you would have to do is you would have to um, start to geoengineer our climate. You'd have to artificially cool our planet. There are proposals that suggest how we could do that. Um, I'm not sure if you want to go down that road. We would basically, for example, we would have to put sunshades into space that reflect sunlight back. We would have to create artificial um, volcanoes that spew aerosols into the air that reflect. We would have to do, we call this um, solar radiation management. You would have to somehow mani manage artificially how much energy our planet receives so that it can balance what it can give off. I don't think we want to go down that route. Sorry? I mean, it doesn't stop global warming. No. Not in, not in the short term. Um, and the reason we can't stop global warming in the short term is because the gases that we release that cause global warming, the greenhouse gases, they're very long lived, uh, especially CO2. So the CO2 that's in the atmosphere today is not the CO2 we released yesterday or last week only. It's CO2 that has been released since the start of the Industrial Revolution by our grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents. The CO2 that we release today will still be up there in several hundred to thousands of years. Half of it. I, it. I mean, it decays exponentially, but only half of our emissions are taken up by the ocean and the biosphere, the race stays in the atmosphere. So it's a very, very long lived process. Yeah? Just sort of following up on that question, as an educator, um, I know you've created this Is there a way to do projections that indicate how, if we did this, this could change? You know, instead of just like this is the way it is, and, yeah. which is very yeah. important. To yeah, yeah. Um, is there, are there I, I totally agree with you, and I'm, I'm glad you bring this up. Um, I actually I gave a talk this weekend at the annual science teachers conference of New York State on this topic on how we communicate climate change and what not to do. And clearly, the thing not to do is to just paint the doomsday scenario with no no solutions because the last thing you want to do is turn students off and get them depressed or, or you know there's su such a thing as emotional numbing and that's not what we want there are things we can do we cannot stop climate change but we can determine how bad or how good or not bad it will be um, and we need to do everything we can to reduce our emission and, and get on a path um, of, of renewable energies and there's a lot that we can do and that message so it wasn't part of this talk, but there's certainly a lot that we can do. Um, you know, from from um, climate change policies, be it be it a cap and trade or a carbon tax, through just investing in research and development, and also education of, of renewable energies. And this needs to happen on a global scale. And I'm not sure if you heard yesterday, Syria decided to join the Paris Agreement. 
So now we're the only country left on this planet that is not participating. This is not a good sign. I could just 